uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present here. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I from uh, University of Dayton. Um, so my uh, university is still um, under the submission. So we submit the CE application. We didn't get the destination yet. We're still waiting for that. Uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to join this uh, CE community. Um, so I hope that my talk today will be, you know, uh, interesting and helpful to uh, some of you. And I, I can also see that like uh, we have some uh, people from UD as well. Um, thank you and welcome. Um, so, <clears throat> so my talk about like uh, the web, right? So uh, at the beginning, I want to just uh, have a, a quick overview about the web. So I think um, everyone uses the web uh, nowadays, right? I, I believe. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, technology behind the scene, uh, like, you know, uh, different technology, but um, regardless of this, um, the web is still there, is still the, uh, the base, the, the, the SCTP protocol is based on like, you know, the web browser will send the request and then the web server will send back the response. And normally the response uh, come by the, uh, the web page, right? That is, is get the web page back. And in the web page, normally they have HTML for um, display the content, some presentation with CSS and, and JavaScript. Um, the code, they, they have some dynamic code running. And uh, for now, um, we have, um, we have a, like, you know, uh, JavaScript is the dominant uh, client side that running in the browser nowadays, right? So it's, you see that it's 70, uh, sorry, 80, uh, uh, 97 or something uh, over there. Um, what JavaScript can do is a lot, right? So at the beginning, JavaScript is just uh, try to uh, have a like more interaction with the user. For example, you know, have some animation, some dynamic content. However, nowadays um, JavaScript can do a lot of things. So, for example, um, everyone use uh, like Google Docs or Messenger, or uh, let's say um, even Zoom have a like the version on the web, right? So they have all of the capability of the like, regular application. For example, they can read the data, read the data. Um, so they can get the camera. So whatsoever is, is over there. So um, yeah, so um, a little bit about the security for the web nowadays. I mean, what I'm talking now is like in the browser side, right? So because of the JavaScript code uh, running, in the browser and normally the code will be downloaded from the server and run in the browser, right? So there's some security concern uh, because if the code can do something harmfully to the computer, then it would be the disaster, right? Uh, and of course the designer of the JavaScript and the web, they will not allow that. They uh, only allow the JavaScript will be downloaded and execute inside the browser and inside the browser, they put that into the, it's called the sandbox environment so that they can restrict some of the, uh, some of the capability so that uh, they can control that one, right? So <clears throat> um, the, another policy that, um, another policy is there is, uh, and it's, 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 it's has been there, it's called, um, um, same origin policy. So same origin policy is the way that it can, uh, because JavaScript can be executed in the browser. And in the browser, you can see that every day you open different website, right? So let's say you open Google, you open Facebook, you open your company website, your browser will store some information from that website. Let's say like, Google, Facebook, thing like that is stored. So normally, for example, they store in the cookie or something like locally in the browser. So it means that like, of course they want, the, because the data, the, the browser store all of the data, right? They're the same browser. So how can they protect from each other? So same origin policy will um, um, 
<coughs> will allow you to do so by saying that if you have a same origin defined by like the pro like protocol and the domain, they will be you know uh, separate to each other, right? So they guarantee that the code from domain A cannot accept the code of domain B. Uh, that for sure, right? And lately, there is another um, uh, security policy it's called content security policy that um, is uh, will be uh, um, this will be the way that is. Uh, sorry, I I met some people that are still in the waiting room. Uh, Um, yeah, so, so so content security policy, the, the, like the the recent technology that they add additional layer to protect the the web by not allow the cross site scripting attack, right? So, for example, in in the past, there's a lot of attack happened by the user just uh, the attacker inject the code somewhere and then it's running in the browser and can steal some information. So, with this uh, content security policy, it will not allow the code to be injected at one time. So look like we have a lot of, you know, uh, mechanism to to protect, uh, you know, uh, the user from you know, some kind of attack, right? Um, however, there are some limitation of this, um, like the this uh, security policy. Uh, so the first thing is that it's still based on the trustworthy. It means that uh, when someone Let's say you develop a website and then you inject the web, uh, the code from somewhere. Um, the problem is that the code inject into the web page, let's say like this, right? So if you, let's say you have a website, you inject the code from ad.com. <clears throat> so um, the problem here is that when you inject the code like from somewhere else, of course, they will download the code, right? And then um, it will um, it will download the code and run in the browser, right? So normally this one is from the third-party JavaScript code. The problem here is when your website uh, include the code from somewhere else, the code running in your website right now here will belong to your website. It's not belong to that one anymore. It's belong to that one, but when it run in the browser, it's belong to your website. And then the browser will treat this ethanol website, uh, ethanol code, and be the same origin as your code, right? So um, the quick, um, the quick question here is that do you, you see that like in this scenario, the ad.com um, JavaScript code will be included in mysite.com and it will belong to the mysite.com uh, origin. It means that they can access all of the credential based on what you have here, right? So in the in the in in, in the reality, right? So when we include a code from somewhere else like this, the code is not controlled by the website owner because it's controlled externally. So so in the past, uh, there has happened that, okay, the, that SNO um, uh, owner can change the content of the, the, the code, or maybe it can be compromised by the hack attacker, then the attacker can inject some malicious code over there so that it's good effect to, to my side. So that, that is the issue, right? Um, so, and the third party JavaScript code like this, it's like, it's very, very common nowadays. Um, so if you go to any website and you may not, you may not notice if you do not have any tune, but if you install some tune, for example, like, like the one that I installed in my browser is called uBlock Origin. They can detect like a lot of, you know, uh, or some other tune like Rostry or um, at a block or something. Right? They detect a lot of, a lot of something like that in, in, in a regular website. And, a study is shown that, okay, there are many uh, websites nowadays, they include at least one external JavaScript. So, so external JavaScript is a norm, right? Um, and as I mentioned to you earlier, um, they had 
uh, so when we install the, the, the JavaScript code from outside, a lot of issue over there because it's the same origin, right? One of the, the issue that you may notice every day that if you search for something, and then if you go to another website, you see the advertisement inside that. So you can see that is there are some privacy leakage here, right? So this belongs to the tracker that written in, in trust party JavaScript. Um, another uh, issue that happened in the past, uh, based on, like, like they is still in this um, SOP, the same origin policy and content, uh, content security policy, is that uh, the attack happened on writer.com like, like uh, some time ago, right? So when the user click on a link, on Reuter, it actually redirect the website into a hacker page like this. So uh, at the user of the Reuter, you may think that Reuter.com already hacked it, right? So actually it's hacked like this, but behind the scene, it's not like that. So behind the scene, um, the issue was based on because of the advertisement network. So, the attacker didn't attack directly to the Reuter.com, but they know that Reuter.com partnership with the advertisement network. So you know that nowadays it's very common, right? So any website like with the content, they get the advertisement so that they get the revenue, right? So the attacker injects some code into that web uh, ad network and they do the reduction the, when the user visits the website to another website. So, so you see that this is one of the uh, one of the issue of this one because Reuters trust this ad network. They include that. They say that okay, hi, I trust you. I include your code into your pay so that I can get money from you, right? But actually, this is the scenario that I showed you earlier, right? Whenever this ad network change the code, Reuters.com do not know, right? Um, that's one scenario. Um, and if you can see here, I, I have a quote from here that um, uh, people said, that, okay, the, the most um, reliable and cost-effective method to inject evil code is to buy an app. Uh, that is the expert, JavaScript expert earlier. So um, one, uh, two researchers, uh, they, uh, they uh, implement this and demonstrate this by doing the, another attack. Uh, it's called million browser botnet. So you may uh, familiar with the, the botnet, right? So botnet is a way that they uh, send the request <coughs> to the like a server to like let's say they have a million requests or maybe hundred million requests at the same time, so that the the server will not have time to respond and then it's on a, like deny service attack. And nowadays, most of the server they they have a the mechanism to ensure that um, if you have a lot of requests uh, at the same time, this is not allowed, uh, especially not from the browser, right? So these two researchers, what they do is they add, um, they add the JavaScript code into the two ad network, they, they, they pay the money. And then they pay the money in the, in the way that um, at the same time, they display the same uh, ad content. So in that ad content, what they did is they, um, they just have a small JavaScript code. What the JavaScript code do is nothing harmful. It just have a loop, like 100 loop, something like that from zero to 200. And for each loop, they uh, display the image from the same user, the same server, right? So that that is me, that mean that when they do that 100 loop, 200 loop, they will, the browser will have a 200 connection almost at the same time to the server to get the image, right? And then they display like 100,000 of people and time 200, it will be like 2 million connection at the same time. And normally the server didn't detect that because it's, it's not like from the program, it's, it, it's from the real browser. So it's called the, the distributed um, DNS attack, DOS attack here uh, in the past, right? So um, yeah, so that is the problem of the web right now. and um, the, the, the challenge here is how to ensure that this guy kind of JavaScript code uh, will not be you know uh, harmful to um, to the um, to the um, 
the end user to the device, um, the perspective. So, so that is the basic of my 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 research that I want to uh, to present today. Uh, so, um, the there's a lot of a lot of <clears throat> a lot of uh, solution already, but there's still open challenges, right? So the short term uh, solution for this and this happened like for example they have a like browser extension blocker or in browser blocker that mm -hmm. they can block any javascript code right but but that is not you know um that is not the long-term solution i mean if you enable uh, and you disable javascript code then the the web will not function no at all because nowadays like a lot of javascript code um are there right um there will be a, a long-term approach here. Let's say, for example, they have a do not track or uh, privacy by design or some of the privacy uh, reference or something like that, right? So that even we have a law, uh, for example, we have a, the GDPR uh, in the Europe and we have a US uh, law, but um, currently there is no, way, I mean, well, no formal mechanism to ensure that this guy can be enforced. For example, the do not track, they will send to the um, browser saying that the, the browser will send the data to the server say do not track, but the server still not track that. So there's no way to, to enforce that. Um, and another challenge that I consider in this work is about the same origin policy. Uh, is the still same origin policy and in the web, they, they 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 still have a problem of the third party code. If the third party code can be malicious or or, or be compromised, um, and the second uh, open challenge that I consider in this work is um, as for now, at the end user and the web server or the the, the web pro provider, um, there is no way that the the user can control whatever the data they want to to share from the the end device. Um, and and the formal uh, insurance as well. So how to ensure that the code running inside your browser have a, some uh, policy that ensure that the policy can be enforced correctly and and is there so that the use at the end user we uh, we will not worry about okay when we open the website uh, it will be safe for us. It's not no uh, it's not it will be no problem with the security. Um, so there's a lot of study about um, the like at the end user uh, like demand as well, right? Uh, so at the user, like I mean, everyone uh, will expect that when we visit a website, there will be no uh, uh, malicious action in the website to let's say steal information or to do something that harmful, right? For example, in the Reuters.com is redirected to some well, other website or um, even worse is can, you know, uh, like download the code to your uh, computer and run the malicious code or something like that, right? So that is a very common um, uh, concern. Um, and everyone, I believe, <laughs> will not um, want this will be happen, right? But in the other hand, send about the, the difference between the reference between the user. Let's say if the user want to uh, just let the, uh, the, the provider do anything or do the user want to do something, control something at the end. Uh, so you uh, you see that in my title, I put that the user-centric uh, solution, right? So um, and for now, there is a lot of study, and like, this is in a social uh, science study, right? They, they study that, okay, citizen, they just trust the big company to not misuse the data. So they, they don't care what the data will be used, right? So that is one trend. Um, so I put a lot of reference here if you want to see later on. Um, and another study said that, okay, um, some, of, uh, some of the user, some of the people, they just want to say that, okay, they uh, even, they still want to share some piece of the data so that they get the target app rather than they just uh, have a random app from them. So, um, I mean, in the in the other world, they do not want to have a complete solution that to add to 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 block on of the ad or to uh, to block on of the tracker. Right? Um, 
And some other study, they say that, okay, they want to have advanced method to, to control the, um, the data that they share from, from the device. So uh, these are the, uh, the motivation of my work. So I, 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 want to, uh, I want to have a solution to ensure that this guy, um, the, the user demand will be, uh, will be implemented in, in, in the practice. So, um, so that, that is my approach. So my approach is like this. Um, I call, in my title, I call user-centered uh, or user-oriented, uh, but uh, I call my approach is user-centered. And also I, call, I, I, I mentioned it, uh, at, I name it a code origin policy as well. Um, so code origin and user centered are uh, like, I call that um, uh, a user oriented approach. Uh, so the idea behind this is that I, uh, when the developer develop the web, um, they need to uh, have a, some basic policy and agreement so that they can be like defined by the developer and the, the provider. So, and, and, and nowadays you see that any website, they, they have agreement, but these agreement are in, in written, right? So, um, and for example, especially when you, um, this is very, very, sim, uh, very, very common in the app. Like when you download the app, you install the app, you, you have to click on the agreement. Let's say you agree with that, right? Um, and, and normally no one will read that agreement, right? So, uh, so my idea, my long-term idea for this is that, so instead of written the agreement uh, in the test, the agreement should be formulated by the policy. And uh, the idea here is that I will provide that, uh, that, that, that policy. So the regular one, the developer just developed the application include third party JavaScript code whatsoever like this. And I will provide some code uh, specification here as policy. So what I will do is that um, this specification will define something that the user, uh, the, the, the code in this, you do something and will not do something. So we have a template for this and then the developer will customize this to, to be embedded into the web app so that we have a discard agreement. And then with this, with this agreement, uh, we will map it into the same way, but now we have agreement in the formal language so that we can enforce this policy uh, when it's run in, in the browser. So we can enforce that. Uh, and then later on, it will be customized by the end user. So that is, a, I call that uh, 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 user-centered or uh, user-oriented, right? Um, and at the end, we will provide some of the formal insurance for that. So okay, if we have this kind of policy, then we ensure that when we run it on the browser, that policy will be enforced. And then the user will have a control on the policy uh, by customizing the policy like that, right? So we have, so this is the, the approach, right? The browser, we have some monitor and to, uh, to have some interface for the user to, to edit the, the, the policy for that user. Right. So, so that is the overall uh, approach. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if uh, you have any question here or um, any questions so far uh, for now. Yeah, I do have one question here. Um, John Kamick from Southern Hampshire University. I'm, I'm wondering if in your concept or, or, or prototyping here, did you consider including some type of domain reputation service to help with that, that origin validation? You know, for example, is this code executing from a malicious or known malicious domain or something like that that would make it easier for end users to determine the right policy? Um, no, um, yeah, at for now, I, I do not have that kind of uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, that one, but I mean, in, in the future, yes, I can consider that. So what, what the idea you suggest here is that I, I, I already thinking about, like we can have some machine learning here to define, okay, whenever you have a, the, the code origin, we can, whether we can disallow that if they are in, in this like blacklist or something. Exactly uh, right. Because I mean, if you think about it from the end user perspective, it'd be very difficult to know which origin is malicious. 
Correct. So Correct. in order to operationalize this, you can actually probably build on the work of others to classify known malicious places where some of the stuff may come from, although it's not a perfect solution by any means. Correct, correct. Yeah, but I, I want to note here that uh, my work here is um, I um, I based on the trust. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I my proposal is based on the trustworthy. It means that like when you include the code from somewhere else, you already trust that code, but but you don't know what the code are doing uh, over there. So so that 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 is a key point. Yeah, but thank you for your yeah yeah I yeah I will um, um, explain further on uh, in my prototype how how I detect the the, the origin. Um, yeah. So, uh, here's here from APUS. Um, the issue that I foresee is you say that uh, the JavaScript that is included by a website. Um, is a known value to the people that are running the website. But I would completely disagree because, and I have experience building websites uh, back when I was a consultant. Um, the, a lot of websites are just getting ad code from various ad services that they're using. And you could easily have 20, 30, 40 different domains that are being accessed just from ad code. Uh, all right, I, I agree, I agree. So you mean that like when the developer insert the code, right? It, so when you insert the code, it just, it just single line of the inclusion, correct? Correct, you're, you're, you're calling out to a JavaScript at an ad server and then the correct. ad server is giving you even more JavaScript to process. Correct. correct, correct, correct. So, but the point I put here is that when you include the code from yours, is is you include that, right? Like the advertisement. Well, and, you, and, you include the code that calls their server to provide their content. Correct, correct. And, and that is at the beginning, that is just only one. But when it run, it will generate a lot of JavaScript code, as you say, right? Correct. Yeah. So my method, I will uh, at the runtime, I will monitor all of the generation, and I I, I will enforce the the policy like de depend on like the the code origin policy that that I provide. Um, so so uh, one yeah. last question: um, when you consider that issue that Harry just raised. Do you have any safeguards to avoid, um, you know, think of like what used to happen with like the zip bombs where you have this recursion issue where you're getting code from domain after domain after domain after domain and the resource cost that's going to start, start, um, you know, accumulating here. Is there a way that your reference monitor can distinguish that? Yes. So um, maybe yes and no. So, I mean, so in my next slide, I will uh, show you how my monitor can can detect this kind of code. Yes, but, but I'm not sure because I mean depend on the policy. So so this is one open challenge in my work is like what kind of policy I can define to prevent such kind of event happen, right? So if I have the I know the event happen like like domain one open domain two domain three. If I know exactly like that. Right, I, I can define the policy to prevent that kind of action happen. But the issue here is that I do not know the event, what the code in that event. So, so as for now, I just define some list of the specific policy. And the action that you mentioned may not be in the list of my policy. But if I know that the list of the action, I can add that policy into my monitor to monitor that behavior. So. I mean, my answer is yes and no in that sense, right? So principle, I can do that, but it depends on the behavior. Uh, that, I, I mean, like, I just, I, I foresee that you're gonna run into an issue, like I said, with, you know, there was one site I built that I kid you not, pulled in JavaScript from at least 75 different places. And then that spawned even more, so, at the end of the day, if you're trying to get it to where the user controls whether or not to allow that, you're basically going to make that site completely unusable, which I, is going to make site users 
fight it and site users right. who aren't making money are not going to uh, partake. I, I, in... Yeah, I completely under, like, agree with you on that. So that one is one of the ongoing work that I, I want to do. So let's say uh, John just mentioned about the behind the scene, how we, we distinguish this kind of behavior uh, automatically, but not at the end user, right? The, of course, the end user will not know about this. And if we just, um, so again, this is like not a complete solution yet, it's just a broad and a prototype, right? So, I mean, I still have a, a lot. So we will discuss about that later on. But, but, but yes, um, I think your point is correctly, I, like, you know, absolutely correct. Um, but I still working on that. I still working on, okay, what kind of the policy I can make to the user that useful? Or what kind of the behavior that I can detect automatically without the user perspective, right? Um, Have you yeah. looked at going toward more of a validation of the JavaScript? Um, like, uh, let's say Google serves out uh, various JavaScript packages for like Google Analytics, that they have a MD5 hash for their code that they update. So then the browser could say, okay, I have a piece of JavaScript coming from google.com. So I'm going to request google.com validate that the MD5 hash is correct. Not yet, no, I, I didn't do that. But the, the approach that I'm doing here is that I don't care about where the code come from. I don't care about the trustworthy. I will care about the behavior of the code. So I don't care whether it's good or wherever some, some other. The issue here is that even the code come from Google and you know that it's exactly from Google, that code may have some malicious action over there, right? So, 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 so that is my, my approach. It's different from the traditional one. I just say, okay, this code is from, come from Google. It's on way good, but that's not the case in the practice, right? So, so my approach is different in the sense that, okay, I don't care where the code come from. I don't care about like you trust that code or not. I would care about the behavior of the code so that if the code have some malicious behavior and I detect it by my policy, then I can prevent that action happen. Does that make sense? Okay. Let, let, let me, uh, I have a lie uh, uh, about, uh, most likely uh, to come. So maybe uh, we can discuss further after the after I, I have a technical detail about how I implement that. All right. Look forward um, to it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so how can I implement the monitor? And I think yeah, you, you got an idea about like the monitoring, right? So the idea here that I just answered the question, I don't care where the code come from. I care about the behavior of the code. So what I care is that I care about what the JavaScript API call or the method or the, you know, the, let's say what kind of thing um, happen in the browser. So I, I, what I do is that I, uh, so this is my current prototype, uh, but in the, in the future, I will make it at the, you know, the JavaScript, um, uh, I, I will make it at a JavaScript one. Um, so, so the idea right now is I, wrap the API by pointing the API con to my, my monitor. And then I disconnect that one. So during that time, I will care about the policy inside my monitor here. So it's mean that the original code cannot get directly to the JavaScript uh, environment until I allow that action to be caught. So that, that is the key point, right? So I could check the policy here. And during the policy, I also use a con stack to know where the code come from. So John mentioned about the case that, okay, um, the browser uh, domain A, con domain B, and then con domain C. So whatsoever, I don't care about that because when I look at the code, the con stack, I know where the code come from. And then uh, with that code where I know the code come from, then I, I, will, I will define the, the policy accordingly, right? So the idea. And um, the, the way that I do that is I based on, it's called the shell protecting JavaScript that I, um, I, 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 I invent, uh, I mean, that, like, I think the, about 10 years ago. So I just have a quick um, overview about that method that is called shell protecting JavaScript. 
So self-protecting JavaScript is a way that you could put the uh, iconic behavioral sandbox um, into the uh, JavaScript execution uh, environment. So let's say you have a website you want to protect like this, right? So I provide a library so that I put that into the website and then I inject that into the website. So during this, together with my library, all of the behavior in this website will be monitored. So the advantage of this is I can allow everything here is unchained, no subject like, for example, like Facebook, JavaScript, they have a subject or, you know, ad save or whatsoever, or Google Kaha, they have a like, okay, they only allow the subset of JavaScript. Um, I do not modify the browser for now. I mean, uh, because I just inject into the, into the web page. And then I do not modify all anything in this one. Uh, so that is a different approach that I have. So, um, so the idea that um, how can I, I can uh, do it is like um, I illustrate the, uh, the the problem that I think John and some other mentioned about like okay you uh, do this attack and then you load this and you load that and you load that. Huh? So I just simplify simplify that scenario by just say the alert function. So in the alert function, like you just have alert like this, right? But in, if you have a JavaScript code, um, you can, let's say you have a bug or you have something, you can uh, load it and load it and load it. So in this case, I let, let's say, okay, you have to, you know, you just pop up and pop up, pop up, pop up, uh, many, many, many times like this. It's similar to the scenario you just mentioned. Let's say um, you open this and you open that and you open that, right? So, so it's, it's, it's happened in the, in, the, in, in the practice. So how do I, uh, ensure that uh, this kind of behavior could not happen. So um, I could define the policy, but before I define the policy, some of you may know about these uh, challenges in JavaScript. Let's say in the alert, it's not just like alert like this. I mean, alert like this is really like this, right? But the, some of the malicious or some uh, code that is obfuscated, they do not write like code like this, they write something like this. Uh, like they define something and then they call something else, right? Or even worse, they can encode the code into something else that if you can just detect the code by, you know, looking for a string, you cannot detect this one, right? Um, and that's one. And the other challenge that um, you, uh, I think uh, someone just mentioned, I, I forgot the name, uh, sorry, uh, John and uh, someone else. Um, Harry. Harry. Yeah, Harry, yeah. So yeah, Harry just mentioned about like, you know, you load it, you load it, load it. So that is very, very common in, in, in JavaScript code, right? They have a code dynamic generation. Um, let's say you load the code and then you load another code and you load another code, right? So I just give you an example here. Let's say um, uh, you have a code and then during the code, you write another code and in another code, you write another code and you can load it. So so this is a challenge, right? The it you see that in the first code, it's just the string, right? But the second code, when it runs, it's generate another code. And of course, in this malicious code, it can generate another code, right? So the D is challenge. So when you do this, if you just, if you just like, you know, uh, scan the string and, 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 and just uh, dis disallow some string, it's not, it will not work. So my method is the way that if I wrap the one, um, I, I wrap the API. I don't care what kind of the code will be written, but I care what the code will be executed because I, I, I monitor the, 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 the API call, right? So um, let's say a lot again. So now what I do is that I will put the function like then I keep the original of the function over there. And in that case, I will uh, redefine that function. And in that case, I will redirect the API con to my function, not the original function. And inside my function, I will have a policy check, right? So if the policy check is allowed, this to be executed, I will do executed that. Otherwise, I will do something else, right? So that is the basic idea of, of my wrapping method over there for the monitor. So um, there are some security issues there as well, like how I can protect my code from like outside uh, malicious code as well. I put that into the 
like the uh, no network function so that the outside code cannot uh, monitor uh, or modify my code. And I put that into a library and then it can inject into the, the website, right? So let's say in the original one, um, you if you want to protect your website with the policy you want, you just inject a code like this into the website. And then the rest of the code will be not modified. Um, and and this is the like the example, but I mean in general, you can inject this code anywhere, like like within the web page or maybe in the browser at the browser extension that I'm going to show you the my prototype, or maybe you can you know later on my long term research is that I can put this card protection inside the browser with you know with some 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 JavaScript library, uh, so that is the overall of an idea. So in this case, you know, the original code will not be uh, changed. Um, so some of the policy that um, I, I give you an example, let's say I limit the alert or something. I can limit the number of like send or read or whatsoever, or can, I can limit the number of how many domain is can be, you know, uh, generated at runtime, something like that, right? Um, so the, related to the question John mentioned earlier, like. I answer yes and no here um, in the sense that, okay, if I know the behavior, I can define the policy to prevent that behavior. And as for now, I do not have a complete list of the behavior that can be considered the malicious. But this is the, what, what I want to, to, to do, right? So, um, so this uh, approach is there, but it's still based on the same origin policy because it cannot distinguish where the code actually come from. So, um, and it's also depend on the developer. The end user have no uh, control on that. Um, so the motivation of my work that I present is to how to ensure that, um, that two things, right? We can define the code that based on different origin and we can allow the user to, to modify the code something. So this is just some example about how, how I expect the, the policy will be. So I can define, okay, policy, Domain one can have a something, domain two have a different thing. Uh, and then, I mean, how the user can monitor uh, or, 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 or control further on that. Um, and I, I provide a prototype on that, right? So, so one of the prototype I currently have is it's called my web graph, uh, implement this idea at the browser extension. So I use the library, I monitor that, and then I uh, enter the policy based on the code origin. Uh, where the code come from, uh, and we do not need an, any API by looking at the the com stack like this. So at the point that I want to monitor the behavior, I call the 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 com stack to see okay where the code come from, and then I get that origin, and then I define the policy by on policy or by on the, the the behavior or by on the user choice. So I have a different layer, right? So like and and I. And I say like it's still the ongoing work. It's not complete one because but I have three layers, right? So like where the code come from, I can disallow or allow. Or even I allow that, I can consider the behavior. So if the behavior is malicious, then I can prevent that. Or if the malicious like the behavior that I don't know and I'm not sure, so then I, I have a user to try, okay, allow or not allow. So that is the, the level I have. Uh, where would where are you proposing that the code be reviewed? Is it on the local machine, or is it is it an example where the code is coming down? You're grabbing it, shooting it up to your server, processing it, and then shooting it back down. So right now, the the code here is I develop at the browser extension. So the browser extension here. So I'm not sure if you ask in my code or the the remote code. So whenever you call the JavaScript verifier or whatever uh, .js, mm -hmm. um, then it is starting to look at the JavaScript that JavaScript code that it's receiving. Is it looking at that code and making the determination on clean or not clean at the machine level of the user or at the machine level of your JavaScript? At the machine level of the user. Okay. Yeah. So the idea here that before, let's say, remember the example I gave you earlier. Um, let's say here, right? 
So here is the original code, let's say window alert. And this code will be downloaded to, let's say the user browser and run into the user browser, right? So my code is above this code and I put something here. So when I do this, I do not monitor, I, I, I mean, I do not change anything of this code, but this code now, they just involve my function because I redefine it. And then I can change it, right? I can and I check it. And then if it's, I not allow this behavior, then I, I will disallow it, right? So, so that, so that, that is, I think that answers your question. Uh, there it is. At the moment. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, um, yeah. So, so I, I call this, and then this is just one example about like how I monitor the cookie information. Let's say I monitor, get the origin that, and then if, let's say if the same origin, then I can allow dips and origin. I can see, okay, whether this, um, this is in the list or not. Um, so I, I mean, in principle, I can detect like, um, detect like, you know, uh, the different behavior based on the, you know, the stay phone policy like this. And, and as for now in my prototype, I just have a simple, uh, simple monitoring. I, I monitor all of the data source, let's say whatever you get the data in the browser and then whatever you send the data out to the browser. So I can consider these two behavior like the reading and the writing. Uh, and I consider the code, yeah, like the code origin as well. Okay, whether you have the same origin to do like read and write, or you just have a read and another write. So, so that is the that is the current example. And at the user interface, I mean, it's a user centric and user oriented one. I develop a uh, UI, um, as you can see here, and related to Henry question earlier. Let's say. Uh, you include just one domain, but at, at, um, when it runs, it include another domain, another domain, another domain, right? So I, with my monitor method, I cache all of this domain and then I can allow the user. For now, I just, I mean, this is very simple um, prototype. I still develop on this, but th at the end, I mean, the idea here that I can cache all this at the runtime so that the user can define further and further so that based on the, the personal need for that. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I evaluate some of this and I can see that, okay, uh, compared with the leading tune, like for example, jupe block origin, you can detect something that, you know, if you have a information leak it from one origin to another origin, I can detect that. Um, and I have some uh, evaluation, let's say runtime evaluation. Uh, of course, um, when we test the runtime, the like, the um the the significant time lot in time is not like different but when we test with let's say very every single um uh single um uh, for example the single operation um is depend on the operation some operation even faster but most of the operation is take longer time it's a lot of overhead that that, that is the point right we tag is on Chrome, Chromium, and Bray as well. So this is one of the limitation uh, for now because we use the runtime stack to, to detect where the code come from. Um, um, so so at for now we um, we still working on that. Um, so my um, my long term vision for this approach is that um, so if the developer can uh, you know. Uh, provide uh, some formal agreement in this uh, origin policy at the development phase, we will create a tool to generate a policy, put that in the code, not only the policy, but we also have uh, some certificate, the formal certificate, put that into them. So this certificate will replace the trustworthy. So I, so this means that I don't care what the code, where the code come from. I don't care like if you trust the code or not. I care about the behavior inside the code with this certification. Um, however, I'm still working on this. So I'm still working on the step. Okay, how we ensure that this code do this one with this policy and, and ensure that it's, it's still working. So my, my idea at the end is that, okay, if we have the policy and we have a certificate together, then at the, the, the user ended, the user can 
just this year, of course, the just do not know how to verify that, but we have a tool in the browser to verify that, okay, the policy and the certificate are there. And remember, this is not like the idea that Harry mentioned about like Google or whatsoever, right? So right now we don't care about the, wherever they come from, we care about the certificate is that matching with the policy that, that you have. So that is the overall idea and the different idea from the, the trustworthy, right? Um, I mean, this is a funny picture that I uh, read from the internet uh, about like the history and the evolution of the web. Um, you can know that it's 30 years, right? So um, I have a, they have a question mark here and I just have funny put here and I, my code origin policy will be there to, to ensure that you know, we can protect the user, pro, the, you know, um, security and privacy using this one. And it's still a lot of work to do. So for example, let's say um, that the question that you asked earlier, like if we have a complex policy then no user will willing to do that policy, right? So we need to learn about that from the user perspective. Uh, what kind of policy will be useful and what kind not useful. And another one that I want to do is that I want to encode the, the, raw, the law into this policy that I have. And the uh, certificate and the verification is another challenge that I'm still working on. Um, and then the one that I provide to you here, I present here is just in the library, Java library, JavaScript library. But what if we include that into the browser? So that every browser in the future browser they have that policy to um, to enforce and to monitor. Um, we still have some ongoing work with my student here. Uh, we published someone uh, some of student defend, and uh, we have a like student uh, still working on this. Um, uh, um, I mean the like the, the following group of the what I am I'm presenting. So. Uh, yeah, this is about the time. Um, thank you for your question so far. And uh, I mean, um, thank you for your time. And now we open the time for, I don't know the organizer, uh, I don't know how much time we have for the discussion. Yeah, so we have just about um, nine minutes left. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or you can also type your questions in the chat. So Dr. Fung, thank you so much for your presentation. Very interesting very valuable research and information that you've presented here. So thank you. Thank you so much. So let's Anna. give it a minute while we have um, some of our participants to either open up their uh, and unmute themselves or you can type in the chat. We'll give it a minute. Yeah, so um, uh, we have a question from John and Harry earlier. Uh, I don't know if they still have question uh, or the question uh, you have uh, answered by my slide or you still have all? They were. Oh, I, have lo I still have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you're saying user centric. So are you basically at one point going to ask the user, do you want to allow stuff from abc.com? No, no, actually, to be honest, I mean, if we do like this, the user will not be uh, agreed to yield that system, right? The user normally do not know, like, okay, this is the domain that the trust or not. And then, and right now my prototype, uh, some of the, uh, some of the, um, some of the policy that I, I asked the user like that. But I mean, in the future, it should be done like, you know, uh, automatically if there's something wrong or something like, you know, suspicious happen. Um, the idea of my user-centered is not like the alert like that, but my user-centered is something like, you know, um, when you have a configuration um, like this, Yeah, like this, um, and 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 I, I'm still in the development of this uh, UI. Uh, so as for now, um, your the answer to you is so right now is, is yes. It's not the alert, but you can do the testing here, in 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 the in the browser, not the alert function. Understood. Uh, just 
when I bring up, let's say, Google Docs, or I bring up, um, you know, like an online system like uh, NetSuite or something like that, they're pulling in so many JavaScripts that do so many things from so many of their servers. Um, if I go in and I say block one of them, am I going to completely and absolutely break the functionality of that website? So it, it, it um, I think it's good that you give them the option, uh, but I almost say that the users might be too stupid to be given the option. <laughs> I think that, yeah, that is a challenge that I'm still working on. Um, I mean, um, at for now, yeah, it's, it's very hard for the user to know whether to allow um, or disallow something, right? So the point here is that um, I think this is the version that I, um, the first prototype, but the the idea that I have is like not care about the, the the domain like this, but we care about the behavior, and then in that behavior, mm -hmm. where it's come from. So care more about the behavior than as you say, right? So they load a lot of other code, but by the end of the day, what they are doing there is that action is harmful or not. So I will care that behavior uh, at the beginning. To, 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 to encode uh, or to, to, I mean, to, to end for the, the policy. You know, it's a, it's a difficult challenge because there's, there's multiple dimensions to the, this type of analysis, right? Where certainly identifying the root of that, that logic, you know, that, that JavaScript logic is important, which domain is coming from, but to determine if the behavior from that domain is malicious in the context of the, what the user is doing, that's a very difficult challenge or in I don't know if there's any kind of classification framework where you know underway with the JavaScript language to determine is this function or this library or this functionality malicious in the context of a browsing session even if it's coming from a trusted quote unquote domain. Correct, right? correct, correct. Yeah. So I mean uh, in the future work I'm consider about you know these do some you know uh, machine learning there over there. Um, to to maybe do like more job for the user than than just ask the user to do. Yeah, and what you may want to consider is that the ultimate value of this may be to develop a very scalable, very flexible sandbox for threat intelligence and identification that can then be used to inform a product that could be released to mass market, right? Because there's certainly some value here in exploring you know, the, the different types of behaviors you're identifying using right. machine learning algorithms to figure out, okay, well, this pattern is known bad. So then ultimately pass this information on to end users. So they don't have to think about how to protect their systems. It's just automatically doing that. Correct. A lot of opportunity there in that space. Yeah, correct. Actually, I have another work. Uh, I have a, a, a master student did that. So, um, and, and this prototype developed by him, uh, by the way, um, so what we did over there is we log on of the behavior in the website and then we do the machine learning over there, but um, it's not integrated to this one. So the idea we do over there is we look at the behavior and then we will see, okay, um, uh, with this behavior, is this website malicious or not, right? Uh, and we, we and that is separate from that, but it's related to the, the part that you, you mentioned over there. Um, a quick question how are you, how would you anticipate the uh, processing script that has been minimized or obfuscated uh, because they don't want their code taken whatever how, how do you propose uh, running that to a certain what the JavaScript is really doing so um... If you remember one of my slides, I mentioned about the code application and the code generation, right? Um, so at for now, I my uh, my wrapping method will take care about that. Uh, what does this mean by that is, let's say back to the example I showed you earlier, the, the alert function. So when I redefine the alert function, uh, 
the code can be offocated, that the, the gas code can be offocated whatsoever, can be, you know, like dynamic generated. So by the end of the day, if that code want to get alert function, they need to call that alert API. And that alert API already wrap it by my, my code and my code already get the reference to the JavaScript environment. So the guest code that you mentioned will not be able to run directly to the, the, the JavaScript code uh, originally without going to my wrapper. So in that case, I can control that. I don't care whether authenticated code or dynamic code because whether you generate a code is need to con my API so that it can run. And when you call the API that I have, then I can control the behavior. That makes sense? Yep, and I will let you go because I don't want to get yelled at by the um, uh, moderators. No, no, it's fine. We can take one more question. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, I have a contact over there. So if you have a... Some more, some more thing. Maybe I can shoot you an email. Uh, I can, I guess I can Google your name. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to put your last slide on, Dr. Fung, so they can see your contact information. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. You see that? Right. Yeah. So, um, and my uh, this prototype, the my web guy one is, uh, I put on GitHub as well. Um, I, uh, if you are interested, I can pass the code. I, I don't have a slide here, but uh, 